his face and the clouds they roll away just as sure as the hands on the clock keep ticking away the time and trouble on my mind makes it hard for joy to find just as sure as winter fades and then it turns to spring i believe deliverance will surely come for me just as sure as my heart will someday be made Just as I do love you, oh, just as I do love you. Just as sure as the text is there to make me perfect in your eyes. It may hurt for a while, but by faith I shall survive. And just as sure as the rain falls on me only to make me grow. No matter how I feel, now I know by what I know. Mm. Just as sure as trials come to pull me close to you. In your presence now I see. A God I never knew. God I never knew. Just as sure as your touch from your hand can turn gray skies to shades of blue. I know you love me. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Just as I do love you. Oh, just as. I do love you. Ooh, I love you and I trust you because you know it's best for me. And even though the crowd sometimes gets loud, oh, and it's hard to hear you speak, hear you speak just as sure as your grace. Is faithful even when my faith I lose. I know you love me. I know you love me. Just as I do love you. I love you and I trust you because you know what's best for me. And even though the crowd sometimes gets loud, yeah. It's hard to hear you speak. Hear you speak. Just as sure as your grace is faithful, even when my faith I lose. I know you love me. I know you love me. Just as I do love you. Just as I do love you.
Happy Sabbath, church. You can do better than that. Happy Sabbath, church. How are we doing today? Are you happy to be in God's house today? Turn with me in your Bibles, please, to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 29, verses 10 to 14. Genesis chapter 29, in fact, we'll start at verse 9. Genesis 29, verse Verses 9 to 14. When you found it, say amen. 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 Genesis 29, verses 9 to 14. Are we together? And this is what the word of God says. Now, while he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near, thank you, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's relative and that he was Rebekah's son. So she ran and told her father. Then it came to pass when Laban heard the report about Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. So he told Laban all these things. And Laban said to him, surely you are bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him for a month. The title of my sermon today is A Night to Remember. A Night to Remember. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, I ask that you forgive me for all of my sins. Please speak through me and allow all who hear the sound of your voice to truly be blessed. Amen. A Night to Remember. Many of you are familiar with the story of Jacob, right? Raise your hand if you've heard it before. Okay, a few of you. Raise your hand if you don't know who Jacob was. Okay, so most of you know. Okay, there's like one hand at the back. Let me break it down for you. Jacob was a really nice man. He was an interesting character, but he had a deceitful nature. You see, Jacob was a type of person that would lie on his own brother in order to get something good that he believed he deserved. Jacob himself lied in order to get the birthright of his brother, even to his father on his deathbed. Now, I don't know about you, but if my brother would lie on me on my dad's deathbed, I wouldn't consider him someone I'd trust, would you? As the story continues, we find that Jacob himself ran away from Esau because Esau wanted to kill him for stealing the birthright, and he found himself by a well. And while he was about to draw water, he heard about a beautiful lady called Rachel. Now, I don't know what Rachel looked like, but the Bible made it clear that she was attractive. She was absolutely mesmerizing. So beautiful that even though she was Jacob's first cousin, he couldn't bear not to be with her. Now, this makes me a little bit uncomfortable. Now, this makes me a little bit uncomfortable. I love my family dearly. But I don't think there'd ever be a shortage and I'd ever find myself in a desperate situation where I'm looking at my cousin thinking about let's get married and have kids. Just saying that, Andre, just putting it out there. It just makes me feel uncomfortable. But Jacob, anyhow, saw Rachel and he started to develop this, this infatuation or, or desire to be with her. And he went and met her father. They had a conversation. And he said to the father, listen, man, I want to marry this woman so badly that I'm going to set the price of the dowry. Are you hearing me? Anyone from Zimbabwe or South Africa here? Raise your hand if you're from Zimbabwe or South Africa. Raise your hand if you're a brother from Zimbabwe or South Africa. Praise the Lord. Okay, I'm seeing the sisters waving and smiling at me. You remember the dowry situation, huh? Now watch this one here. Jacob finds himself in Laban's house. And he goes to Laban and says, listen, I'm willing to marry Rachel, my first cousin. And I like her so much that I'm going to work for seven whole years. I don't know about you, but would you do that, brothers? Would you do this, brothers? You're sitting next to your wife and saying no. 
Awfully confident now, bro. Awfully, she signed the death contract to death to us part, so she's locked in now, right? I hear you, I hear you. Anyway, so he decides to set the dowry. Now, I did some research about dowries, and it blew my mind. Watch this carefully. When a person pays a dowry, they are not buying their wife with finance. When a person sets the dowry or pays the dowry for, for their bride, they are not owning that woman as their property. That woman does not become your footstool, brothers and sisters. Are you hearing me? That woman is to be loved and to be cherished. And the dowry, the dowry shows the family that you care about the woman so much that you're willing to put a price on your love for her. You hear this? If you're from Zimbabwe and you're thinking about get getting married, just drop those lyrics to someone. And so he decides to work for, for seven years. And as he works for seven years, the Bible makes it clear that for him, it was only but a day because he loved her so much. But Laban was crafty. Now, I don't know about you, but I know that I have family members that are crafty. You know, when you take a trip to Jamaica and you go see family members who you don't really know, and they pretend that they know you, and they want the shirt on your back and the shoes on your feet because they're crafty, you hear me? And you don't really know them, but you stay with them because they are family. And they look at you be differently because you're English. And the English see you as a foreigner, and the Jamaicans see you as a foreigner. And you try and speak the patso, but it doesn't quite work. Are you hearing me? And you find yourself in a situation where some of these people want to teeth out your eyeball because they think that you're made of money. Mm -hmm. like some of you know what I'm talking about. Laban was that guy, crafty. Somebody who you wouldn't really want to trust. Somebody who you would stay away from because you knew they would try their best to stiff you over. On Jacob's wedding night, he, now bearing in mind, he hasn't slept with, with Rachel yet, so he doesn't know what she's like intimately. And the wedding night comes and there's feasting and celebrating and, and the night comes and, and, and the moment comes where he's slightly intoxicated but wants to sign the contract because back then they didn't have contracts like we do now. They didn't have the whole sign in the register process. Your sign in the register was you consummating the marriage. So he goes into his bedroom and he sleeps with his wife. And he wakes up in the morning horrified, realizing that that wasn't the woman that he paid a dowry for or worked for. How would you feel? How would you feel? Furious, Furious right? I wouldn't be happy about that at all. And the worst thing about it is, is Laban then, then, then tries to fool him by spinning this story saying it's wrong for me to allow the younger sister to get married first. So instead, what makes it better is that you marry both sisters. Awkward. So Laban says to him, finish off your married week, right? Finish off your marital week. Enjoy yourself with Leah. But the Bible makes it clear that Leah wasn't attractive. So when he was being intimate with her, he was thinking about her sister. You didn't think it was like that? When he was making love to her, she was thinking about the beautiful experience and this moment she had been waiting for for the whole of her life. But while he was being intimate with her, he was thinking about Rachel. I don't even know if he called Rachel's name. The Bible doesn't say. But as far as I'm concerned, he was sleeping with Leah, but making love to Rachel. Man, you're quiet today, chat. And so after the week had finished, he then is gifted with Rachel and decides to work another seven years. 14 years for a crook. I don't know if I'd do that when, you know, I love my wife to pieces, but 14 years? Pray for your pastor. As time progresses, they start squabbling and start arguing because things aren't right. And I'm assuming they started comparing each other. I'm, I'm assuming they started talking about who was better in bed and who cooked the nicest food and, and who knew Jacob intimately and who knew Jacob's likes and dislikes. And I'm sure they started to bicker and to argue. And as time progressed, Leah decided that she would sleep with, with, with her husband in the intention of getting pregnant. And, and child after child, she became pregnant. She started off with Reuben, then Simeon, then Levi, then Judah. And, and, and Leah started to get frustrated because she started to think to herself, why is the Lord blessing Leah and not blessing me? 
And so Rachel started to bargain with her husband, and she said to her husband, listen, even though you can't get me pregnant, take Bilhah, my, my handmaiden, and you sleep with her and produce some children, and she will bear children on my knees. So while she is holding my knees, pushing out that child, for me it will feel as though I am giving birth. So her husband doesn't say no thanks, but he gets on with it and starts to sleep with Bilhah, and Bilhah produces two children. Then Leah starts to get upset and starts to talk to her husband and says, listen, I don't know if I can have any more children, so instead I want you to sleep with Zilpah and I want you to produce children for her. And so Zilpah produces two children. And then just before the end of the story, before things turn left, Rachel bears two children who Jacob loved so much. And their children have really interesting names. And I, th I think it's nice when you choose a name for your child that the name has a specific value. I mean, don't name your, name, don't name your child something indicative of a struggle or pain or suffering. Name your child something beautiful, something like Elijah, something with power and strength. Are you hearing me? But they started to name their children interesting names. So Reuben's name meant the Lord has seen my affliction. Because as far as Leah was concerned, she was suffering in this loveless marriage. And deep down inside wanted to escape, but didn't know how to escape the pain and suffering that she was going through in her mind. Simeon was her next child. Simeon meant the Lord has heard I was hated. Because every time she laid with her husband, she knew that he wasn't really connected with her. Her next child was called Levi, meaning joined to my husband, because she was convinced that surely the third time my husband will make love to me and will be so connected with me that we will be joined together. Her next child was called Judah, which means praise God, because she thought surely this time God should be praised. As things continued, she then had Dan, meaning God has judged. And then Naphtali, meaning my wrestling and my struggle. Then Gad, meaning good fortune. Then Asher, meaning happy and blessed. Then Isaac, meaning my wages and deserving. Then Zebulun, meaning dwelling. Then Joseph, meaning increaseth. And Benjamin, Benjamin, meaning son of my right hand. All of these children had, ex had really important names which were indicative of the struggle that they went through. Some people here today are struggling in their relationships and in their marriages and don't know where to turn because if they go to the church, people will gossip about them. If they go to their family, their family may judge them. If they go to their friends, their friends may use it against them. So they turn to God. And hoping for deliverance, they cry out to him, but don't always get the answers that they want. I didn't understand the story of Jacob. And the story of Jacob made me feel very uncomfortable. The idea of being married to two sisters seemed like craziness, madness. But then I read a story, a true story, about a man who grew up in the Congo. He was a Congolese politician and military officer military officer. He grew up in Zaire. Zaire was what, it was what Congo was called before. It was changed to the Democratic Republic of Congo in 1997. But watch this carefully. The guy's name was Mobutu, Sese, Senko, Kuku, Nambenda, Wa, Za, Banga. Shall I repeat that again? <laughs> One more time. His name was Mobutu, Sese, Seko, Kuku, Nyabendu, Wazabanga. I had to practice that hard in the car coming to church today, man. One more time, you're taking the biscuit. <laughs> but that wasn't his birth name. His actual birth name was <clears throat> Joseph Desiree Mobutu. Nice and easy. He was a politician, and listen to this interestingly. He was the chairman of an organization of African unity. Mobutu served as a chief of staff for the, for the army and was supported by Belgium and the USA. He himself decided to depose the de democracy and the elected government and executed the prime minister, whose name was Patrice Lumumba. Mobutu took power directly, led military, and stated a second coup, becoming the military dictator of what was called Zaire back then. You're hearing this? Sounds kind of familiar, right? Didn't Boris Johnson want to do something similar? 
Didn't Boris Johnson want to have like more power than parliament? Huh? Doesn't Donald Trump want to do the same? You see, when we go through history, we recognize that man naturally is sinful. And man naturally likes power. And if man is given too much power, they will do all manner of evil unless the Holy Spirit lives in their life. Mobutu was a powerful dictator. People were afraid of him because if you spoke up against him, he'd just have you executed. Now, that wasn't the interesting fact I wanted to mention. The interesting fact was Mobutu's choice of women. Mobutu decided to have a few wives, and I believe he had 21 children in total. A lot of mouths to feed. His second, second wife's name was Bobby Ladawa. And he decided to take her twin sister, Kozia Ladawa, as his mistress. Watch this carefully. This guy was living the biblical story right here in a painful way. He decided to marry a woman. And then he decided to take her twin sister to be his wife, to be his concubine or mistress. And he decided to get them pregnant at the same time. So their children grew up like brothers and sisters, but they were cousins. Is that right? Awkward. Awkward. And he found that in his household, there was so much squabbling and arguing and backbiting and problems. Because when he would sleep with one, the other would get vexed. And when he would go to the other, the first one would start moaning. And before he realized it, although he was powerful in the community, he himself was weak at home. I don't know if you're hearing where I'm going with this. Jacob was desperate to find a wife. And he decided that he would take the matter into his own hands and decided to chase after Rachel because he saw she was beautiful. But it wasn't God's intention for him to marry Rachel. Rachel was never God's intention. Rachel was Jacob's intention. But God's intention was Leah. You see, Leah had lots of sons. But through the lineage of Judah, Jesus Christ came. And had it not been for Leah, the tender-eyed lady who wasn't particularly attractive to look on, there would be no lineage for Jesus to come through. Sometimes in life, we get to a stage where we start calling out to God and asking God for things that, want, that we believe look good but are dangerous for us. You hearing me today, church? A Polish proverb says, says, um, love enters a man through his eyes and a woman through her ears. One more time. Love enters a man through his eyes and a woman through her ears. This is why some road men come to our sisters with their Vaseline lips, acting like they're all big and bad. Start telling them to hold things and hide things in the house for them. Are you hearing me? And they start dropping some nice lyrics because the sisters like the sweet sound of lyrics in their ears. Are you hearing me? Whereas men aren't too fussed on how a woman speaks, we're more interested in how a woman looks. Like none of the married men are agreeing with me. <laughs> you don't believe your wife looks beautiful? Okay, like one person, the rest of you don't wanna say anything. That's okay, you discuss it with your wife when you get home tonight. In the rise of social media, especially Instagram, there have been many couples who have broken up because their partner, partners don't find them aesthetically attractive anymore. If you spend time looking at social media, you'll spend time looking at beautiful people who were airbrushed and filtered to perfection, but it's just not reality. And if you are looking at a person in social media or through the lens of social media to find somebody who you can settle down with and be happy, you will find yourself in deep misery because there is more to a person than just the way they look. Looks change, looks fade, hairlines start to recede, people start to get gray, things start to go south, are you hearing me? People start to get weight, put weight on in different places. People's looks change but their personality and characters should always remain the same. And if we are looking for a long-term partner or to enhance the marriage that God has blessed us with, we need to start investing in it. Like proper, real, genuine investment. The same investment that people do when they get married. I mean, people spend thousands on weddings. They spend thousands on the cake, the shoes, the dress, the clothes, the makeup, the hair, the car, 
feeding the guests, wedding favors, the honeymoon. They spend thousands investing in the one day, and they spend very little investing in the actual marriage. How can anybody expect their relationship to grow with God if they don't spend time investing in it? How can anybody expect their relationship with their spouse or significant other to grow if they don't spend time investing in it? Author Dr. Sue Johnson, for the book Emotional Function Couples Therapy, came up with an acronym for communication. Because everybody knows that in order to have a good relationship, whether it's with God or your spouse or your girlfriend or your boyfriend or whoever, you need to keep the line of communication open. Sue Johnson came up with this acronym, A-R-E, referring to accessibility, responsiveness, and engagement. Sue Johnson said, in order for a relationship to work, the line of communication has to constantly be open. The question has to be this, I can find you if you make yourself available to me. And I can find you if you make yourself available to me. One more time, I can find you if you make yourself available to me. Accessibility requires frequent physical proximity and emotional availability. Some people just aren't emotionally available. Like physically, they can do a good job. Financially, they can do a great job. Spiritually, they can do a great job. But when it comes to emotions, they're vacant. And if you're in a relationship and there are no emotions and there's no emotional connection, then how can the relationship truly grow? People need to know that they are accessible to their spouse. Next point, responsiveness. When you approach me, I respond with emotional attentiveness. It means I look at you, hear you, feel you, and respond in a loving and affirming way. Again, one of the greatest threats to responsiveness is technology or distractions that take your mind away from your spouse. You listen to this carefully? Like, If we genuinely want a good relationship with our spouse or our partner, we need to be available for them. That means they need to be able to pick up the phone and call us and we are there for them. One of the biggest flaws of Jacob's relationship with his wives is he wasn't emotionally connected to Leah, but was emotionally connected to Rachel. And Leah sought to give him lots and lots of children, but it was to no avail. Because deep down inside, there was no true connection. You're awfully quiet, church. And the last is engagement. When you are accessible and sincerely try to respond to my needs, we connect. This type of connection built over time brings a sweetness, a peace, and a strength which is unique and powerful among human relationships. One of the biggest breakups of relationships or marriages is not adultery. It's not people playing away from home. It's irreconcilable differences. Two people just can't work out anymore. They can't talk, they can't connect, and the relationship starts to break down. And this is why I always advocate counseling. Counseling is not just for people who want to get married, but counseling is for people who want to strengthen what they have. If there is no counsel, how can you get strength? Watch this. It's like if my car breaks down, and I, I use this analogy because lots of people say, I don't want to go to counseling, I don't believe it, God is my counselor. Okay, watch this. If your car breaks down, do you not call the AA or the RAC or Green Flag? Or do you just stand on the hard shoulder saying God is my counselor? Like, I'm just putting it out there right now. Ridiculous, right? Like seriously, seriously. If I get sick, do I not go to a doctor for healing or to get better? If a pipe bursts in my house and water starts flooding through my ceiling, do I not turn off the stop clock and then call a plumber to come and fix it? If I have an electrical problem in my house, do I not call an electrician? Are you hearing where I'm going with this? For regular things we call regular people, but when it comes to people helping us emotionally, it's almost like we're scared to ask for help. A man came to a woman and he had a conversation with her. And he sat her down because she had been single for 10 years. How long did I say? 10 years. She turned 40 and she was saying to her friend, listen, I need to find somebody to settle down with. Because if I don't find someone to settle down with, I may never have children. So her friend sat her down. And he said to her, what kind of things are you looking for in a man? She said to him, do you really want to know? 
I said, yes, I really do want to know. And then she began to expand. As a woman in this age, I can do everything myself. I don't need a man to complete me. I don't need a man with money. I don't need a man with, cu- with a car. I don't need a man with a house. I don't need a man that's got a side hustle. I don't need a man to bring me anything because I can pay my bills. I have my own house. I have my own car. I have savings. I have money in the bank and I'm about to buy my second property. So he looked at her, thinking to herself, okay, thinking to himself, okay, let me dig deeper. So he said to her, so what are you looking for? And she said, I need excellence. I need to be mentally, physically, sexually, and emotionally stimulated. I need a man that's not simple-minded, but someone who is equally matched with me or equally, equally yoked. I need a man that's not a waste man to come and sponge on me financially, but a man who can add to the financial pot. I need a man that's sensitive enough to tell me that he loves me, but also grounded enough to put me in my place when I mess up every once in a while. I need a man that's got integrity, not somebody who's going to play games and and, and tell lies. I need a man who's family orientated, not somebody who cuts off his family thinking he's better than everyone else. I need a man that's got respect because if he respects me, then I will submit to him. And if he can't respect me, then I can never submit to him. I need a man that's made by God and shapen in the very likeness of his character. That's got a beautiful physique, a nice personality, and a wonderful heart. As she started to spill the beans, the man looked into her eyes, puzzled, and said to her, girl, you're asking for a lot. And she looked at him carefully and said, I'm worth a lot. Question that I wondered when I read this was, is the woman too fussy or does she need to maintain her high standards? I let you think about that one. Why have I mentioned all of this stuff in my sermon? Well, the title of my sermon is A Night to Remember. I entitled it this message, I entitled the message this for this reason. I believe that every decision we make has a long-lasting consequence. And in order for us truly to be happy, we need to spend time investing in Jesus. We can never truly develop a close and personal relationship with God if we don't spend time with him. And he wants to wrestle with you in the night. He wants you to be on your knees calling out his name so he can truly bless the character and the person you are. But in order for this to happen, you will need to remember each night you spend on your knees. Are you hearing me? The biggest way to solve a problem is by talking to Jesus. And as we are talking about relationships, I must say don't rush and find yourself in a situation where you are relenting the mistake that you have made, but instead rush to spend time on your knees. Many times we find ourselves in situations that are difficult, rush to spend time on your knees. If you don't know whether to go left or to go right, rush to spend time on your knees. If you're going through a difficult problem that you can't face yourself or serve, or deal with, rush to find time on your knees. Are you hearing me, church? If you want Jesus to open doorways for you and to give you a relationship like never before and allow you to be happy, rush to spend time on your knees. Because the only way we can overcome any situation is the time that we spend on our knees. You've heard the sermon today, and you just want to say, Lord, I have issues in my life that I need you to deal with. I need you to strengthen my life. I need you to strengthen my relationship. I need you to strengthen me. If you feel this way, just stand where you are. Just stand where you are. Lord, I need you to strengthen my relationship. I need you to strengthen, strengthen me. Just stand where you are. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. Dear Jesus, I ask in a special way that you will strengthen each person. I ask that you will help each person who is looking to find a partner and settle down. May you bring to them the right person, a person who will enhance them and build them up and not somebody who will break them down. May you show them who to search for and and where to look, Lord. May you guide them in their quest and may you allow them to feel connected to you and that person. I ask, Lord Jesus, that you strengthen the relationships which are happy. Because we we shouldn't just talk to you and bless your name when things are going bad. We should praise you when things are good too. Bless the relationships also and the marriages here that are strong. 
Bless the hearts and minds of those who are connected to their spouse or their girlfriend or boyfriend or fiance and allow them to be strong in you. And my third prayer, Lord, is for those who who are struggling in their relationship or marriage, who need you, Jesus, who need deliverance, who need to hear the sound of your voice and know, Jesus, that you are the, the mender of broken things. And in you there is restoration and healing. Bless each person today, Lord. Touch our hearts and allow us to feel the magnitude of your goodness. In your holy name we pray. Amen.